Um, great. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Henny Benamor. Uh, Henny is an assistant professor at Arizona State University, where he leads the Interactive Robotics Laboratory. Uh, in 2018, he received the NSF Career Award. He also received the Fulton Outstanding Assistant Professor Award and the Top 5% Teaching Award. Previously, he was a research scientist at Georgia Tech. Henny's research focuses on artificial intelligence, machine learning, human robot interaction, robot vision, and automatic motor skill acquisition. He received the highly competitive Daimler and Benz Fellowship, as well as several best paper awards at major robotics and AI conferences. Uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing um, about more about his research. So let's all welcome him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, for being a gracious host for the kind invitation also. And it's a great pleasure to talk to all of you today. So my talk today is on human-robot interactive collaboration and communication. And it's kind of a mouthful of a title, but really the main um, projects and um, things I'll be presenting today are going to be methodologies and algorithms that bring humans and robots together in a shared physical space, while also enabling physical collaboration, communication, and also learning. So just generally regarding the talk, if you have any urgent question in between, feel free to ask. Otherwise, obviously, we're going to have a Q&A session in the end. OK, but before we start anything regarding robotics, um, maybe a little bit of a background about myself. So I'm German, but I actually grew up in the beautiful country of Tunisia, North Africa, during my childhood. And uh, Tunisia is a very famous country for tourism, so it's a touristy place. But I grew up in the southern parts of Tunisia, in, or at least very close to a city called Tatawin. And to a lot of you, that probably does not really ring a bell. But if I pronounce it a little bit different, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of this place. And it's the planet Tatooine from the Star Wars movies. And so growing up, I had this impression that robots are actually roaming around just a couple of miles away from me. Now, the Star Wars movies are also a great exhibition of robotics technology, in particular, human-robot collaboration and teaming. And so in the, famously in the Star Wars movies, we have the C-3PO and R2-D2 robots that by the end of the movies actually become the hidden stars. And one thing that's really great about this movie is that it exhibited a lot of technology and technological advancements, um, things like human-robot collaboration and physical interaction, things like language and instructions. So very famously, the Princess Leia gives R2-D2 the instructions for the Death Star. And we also saw all sorts of multimodal communication, communication through visual signals and visual cues. And that's something that really excites me and interests me, how to bring humans and robots together in shared physical experiences such that they can learn from each other. And at the same time, we want to have the ability for bi-directional communication, meaning we want humans on one hand to provide instructions, interactions, so physically interact with the robot and also corrections. So there's some information flowing from the human to the robot. But at the same time, the robot may also provide explanations, questions, interactions together with the human. And most importantly, we want them to share the physical space and really work together and grow together. And so it's not just the human providing demonstrations and stepping away, but we'd like the human being part of the actual task and communicating and constantly collaborating with the robot. So that's exactly what I'm working on in my lab. And here, just a video, kind of a, a teaser video, a snapshot of the kinds of projects that we have, robots that learn to hug you, robots that do industrial assembly together with you, or robots that learn to, uh, for example, uh, just catch a ball as you throw it. So this sort of collaboration is, is of course important. Um, but also has many facets in how it exhibits itself. And today I'd like to talk about three specific things um, that I'm working on. Um, so there's a bunch of different things within this larger topic, but there's three specific things I'll be talking about today. One is how can we teach robots to generate responsive motion? How can they respond to a human partner? How can robots learn to identify the proper timing Many people say timing is everything. So how can they synchronize that timing with a human partner that they can only observe, but they cannot really ask about the, the current time? And at the same time, I'll be also talking about communication and the role of language in all of this and different manifestations of language. So not only natural language, but also pictorial language, similar to 
um, hieroglyphs here. Okay, and so with that, we come to the outline of my talk. And I shamelessly structured it along um, scenes from the Star Wars movies. And so in the beginning, we'll be talking about learning responsive motion with a mutation. In the second part, we'll be talking about instructions and how we can use language to create language condition policies. And finally, I'll be talking about visual signals and intention projection. So in the final part, it's going to be the robot that's going to be talking to the human and not the other way around. Okay, so let's start with learning responsive motion. So what do we mean exactly by responsive motion? So here are a couple of depictions of that. So imagine a high five collaborative lifting or a person handing another person a book. What we'd like to have is for robots to engage in these similar activities. So here you see a couple of pictures from my research. Of course, you may be wondering, hey, why is Professor Krömer in this? So Oliver was actually a former teammate uh, or lab mate of mine and is a dear friend and a frequent collaborator on joint papers. So the method that I'll be proposing today is to try to learn this kind of social and collaborative behavior through imitation. So imagine that you have a lot of material, a lot of video that shows you this kind of collaborative behavior. Can we learn to extract robot controllers automatically from these videos? And so how would that roughly um, be approached? Imagine a robot that is sitting on a park bench on the first day and is just observing how people are performing high fives. So it's observing multiple people high-fiving each other. And so can we extract from these demonstrations a model that models the mutual dependencies between the people, the two persons, how they synchronize time and space such that the robot on the next day can engage in a similar action. And so in order to realize that, we proposed a framework called interaction primitives, which is a data-driven framework to learn human-robot demonstration or human-robot interaction from demonstrations. The ultimate idea is actually relatively simple. We have a bunch of demonstrations. We extract from that a joint probability distribution that models the relationship of person A to the person B. So that's a joint probability distribution and we call that an interaction primitive. Once we're finished with that, we can condition on new actions of person A. So we observe new actions and we get back a conditional probability distribution that tells us what should person B or what would person B have done in this case? And the most important element in this framework is that it actually bridges the divide between prediction and control. So predicting and controlling or responding become two sides of the same coin. So what does that exactly mean in technical terms? So here's an example for that. So in this case here, you see me and my former student Marco wearing these motion capture suits and we're performing a high five. So what we can do now is we can take that data and that data obviously has both my trajectories as well as the trajectories for Marco. And the first thing we do is actually to represent these trajectories within a certain representation. In particular, we represent the data, so our trajectories y, as a function of some hidden state. So we have a, a hidden latent state, latent state s, and a function h generates out of that latent state, generates our observations y. And of course, there's also some noise that we're modeling with this. So we can model some um, typically Gaussian noise. But the most important thing is this latent representation should still be able, should allow us to extract if we want at any moment, the states A and B for the two interaction partners. I'll be talking about this latent encoding in a second, um, and it's a relatively simple one. So once we have this fixed site sized latent state, we can learn a probability distribution over that, a joint probability distribution, which forms a generative model of our mutual actions and the dependencies. Meaning if one person goes to the, uh, the right, the other person would follow, and that's represented in this distribution. Now, after training at testing time, we replace one of the people by a robot. And now the robot can observe a partial trajectory of the human partner. So in this case here, the person is about to lift the arm. So it's still kind of in the initial phase of the movement. And so we take that partial observation Y star and we condition on that. So we basically perform Bayesian inference. We condition on that and we get back a probability distribution over S, over our latent states. Once we have that, we can extract from the latent state the component A or B. And then depending on that, we get either the prediction 
all the control that we can use to control the robot. Now, in order to understand this, we need to understand what this latent representation is. And it's actually a relatively simple concept that has been used in a number of other papers before. And so we represent this function h of s, we represent it as a superposition of Gaussians. So we have a, a bunch of Gaussians, um, not Gaussians, radial basis functions, uh, so squared exponential functions. And each one of these squared exponential functions gets multiplied by a weight, wi, and the superposition or the sum of all of that generates the trajectory that we're interested in. So on one hand, we have these parameters wi. Uh, another thing that gets introduced using this latent space representation is that we also now have a, a relative timer. We have been, uh, because of the radial basis functions, we have this parameter phi, which you can think of as a relative timer that is zero at the beginning of the motion and one at the end of the motion. And so, in our first paper, we tried to kind of have each one of them separately, time and space. So we used the spatial aspect, so a vector w of all of the wi's, all of our weights, go into this vector w, and that becomes our latent state representation. And we have separately the var variable phi for the relative timer, so the phase variable. And what we did then is we effectively decouple time and space and try to find the phase variable using sequence alignment. So temporal dyna uh, dynamic time warping, for example, and estimate the latent state representation using traditional Bayesian inference. But unfortunately, that was not a good idea at all. Um, so time and space are actually really informative of each other and they're correlated. And if we can exploit that, they can, we can get um, some really nice um, inference mechanisms out of that. So really we learned the hard time not to separate time and space. In order to understand that, let's take a look at an example, at uh, an example where we're going to see prediction errors in time and in space. So here my student Joe is playing catch with a friend. So the friend throws a ball and Joe is trying to catch it and he's, his timing is wrong. So he's anticipating the ball wrong. And as a result of that, the ball bounces out of its hand, his hands. Similarly, when he anticipates the position the wrong way, there's also, um, he's falling over, he basically didn't get catch the ball. Now, of course, these can also be compounding each other. So a mistake in time and in space can lead to a larger mistake overall and a, um, basically a failure of the collaboration. And so what we wanna do is to be able to improve time and space or the estimate of time and space. And so for that, let's, analyze this a little bit further, a little bit more in technical terms. What's actually going on here? Um, so imagine we have here this graph over here. So this is our prediction, this gray line, this gray tra trajectory. So on the x-axis, we have time. So the prediction we're making. Um, so so x-axis is time and, and gray is our prediction. And y is some spatial parameter. So it could be, for example, the y position of the ball. And so this is, what we thought were how the ball is going to be moving. And right now, given our current estimate of time, we're estimating the ball to be here. So that's our estimated observation. But unfortunately, what we get from the camera tells us, well, actually the ball is not there. So we have an observation error. So what could be the source of this observation error? So one of the sources for this observation error could actually be a temporal error. In other words, our overall prediction is actually correct but our prediction in time is so meaning kind of our phase estimate where we think we are in time is wrong. So we sh if we shift the phase estimate backwards, then suddenly we have get a position which is pretty much in line with our observation. Similarly, if we shift our phase estimate forward in time, we can see that there is potentially another moment in time where again, our predicted position would have been in line with our current observation. But which one of the two is it now? So we're incurring observation error due to temporal error, but we actually don't know. So there's ambiguity here. We could be um, ahead of the actual time or we, can, we could be behind of the actual time where we are right now. And this is really where we can exploit multimodalities. So we can get a better estimate of time if we use more spatial variables and multimodal spatial variables. So let's take a look at this estimation error again. 
So again, we have the same scenario, but now we're adding another sensor variable. So this could be, for example, the position of the arm or something like that. So here again, so in this scenario, this is where we're estimating where we are in time. And now we have an observation error in Y1 and an observation error in Y2. However, because we've added this second spatial parameter, we can now clearly identify how we need to change our temporal estimate, how the phase variable needs to be changed in order to reduce the error in both of these spatial parameters or spatial variables. So by shifting time forward, we actually reduce the error in Y1 as well as Y2. So this is Y2 and this is Y1. And in this case here, both of them would be aligned. The observation with our prediction would be perfectly aligned. So in other words, we have here a common error source. And generally, temporal error induces correlated observation errors in space. In turn, we can use these correlated observation errors in order to backtrack um, or perform an inference in time and get better inference about where we are in time. So how do we incorporate all of that into the latent space? It's relatively straightforward. So if we had just the spatial parameter before, we now also add phase, so phi, as well as the phase velocity. So the like, velocity in, or kind of um, the movement in phase, we add that into our latent parameter. And of course, we still have W, which represents the shape of the trajectories that we've observed during demonstration. And so when we now perform inference, we get a distribution over the phase variable, which roughly tells us where are we in time but we also get the uncertainties around that. So that's really helpful. So we know where we are in time, but also how uncertain we are with regards to that. And we get the distribution over the basis function weights, W, which is a probability distribution over the trajectories and how they're going to evolve in the future. So since this is a distribution, we can sample from it. And so these red trajectories that you see here are samples from the distribution and the blue trajectory is the mean of that distribution. So in turn, we can use this for prediction. Now, the actual inference process is a little bit outside of uh, what I can cover in this talk, but just roughly what we're performing is an approximate inference scheme where we're trying to infer the uh, probability of the latent state given observations from the human. And the way we do that in order to be tractable we actually represent both the prior as well as the posterior. So this is our prior here, and this is the posterior. We represent those as an ensemble. So we don't need any parametric assumption. So we don't need to know that it's a Gaussian or not Gaussian, what kind of family it belongs to. Another advantage is that we can actually just take our initial demonstrations from the human and use those as the particles or the items of our ensemble. So our distribution is exactly the set of training data points. Another advantage of this um, inference scheme is that we can issue any sort of linearization. We don't need Taylor linearization either for the system update matrix, so or the, the general system update it wouldn't be a matrix in this case. So neither for the forward prediction nor for the measurement do we need any Taylor approximation, which is a really nice way of incorporating um, nonlinearities. Okay, so I'll leave it at that just in the interest of time, but we actually implemented all of this in a library called Interaction Primitive Library, which you can download here, and I'm happy to um, send you the slides so you can, can find the, the location. Okay, so let's go back to throwing and catching. So we do the same thing as before with the high five. We have demonstrations from two people where one person is throwing the ball and the other one is catching it. We perform the basis function representation. We generate an ensemble probability density distribution, which is our interaction primitive. And then at runtime, the person throws the ball and the robot should catch it using inference. Okay, now again, as we mentioned earlier, the more modalities we have, we can the better we can estimate time and space. And in this case, we actually, so even though it's throwing, we don't only take the ball position into account. So for that, we use motion capture, but we also have other modalities, in particular, a smart shoe that you can see here being worn by my student. And that shoe provides us with information on the foot pressure. So where the person is um, basically placing the pressure. 
And this is really helpful in the initial phase of the interaction where the ball did not yet leave the hand of the, um, of the person who's throwing the ball. Okay, let's get to the action. So here we see Joe throwing the ball and the robot catching it. And then the same thing again with blindfolds on. So the reviewer really wanted us to, to show that we're not just throwing the, the ball into the box. So, so yeah, we can see that everything that you, that you see in this video that was actually learned from just these demonstrations initially. But really the critical item here is not necessarily the, the learning itself, but rather the, the ability to do inference also in time. And so what you see in this video here in the left upper corner is an estimate of where we are in time right now. So an estimate of the phase variable, whether, whether we are at the beginning or whether we are at the end. And you can see, see that we have a probability distribution that's evolving, that's telling us roughly where we are in time. And at the end, we were at the end of the, of the interaction. So just to kind of spice it up and have a little bit of fun, we applied the same technique and the same methodology to a, a scenario where we're learn, learning how to hug a person. So this teddy bear here is trained to hug people. And the way we did that is by having a training time, a person teleoperate the robot and another person perform the high fives. And then once we've done that, we can extract our interaction from it. So here's then the result. In the beginning, you can see the robot adapting spatially on the type of hug you're executing. And then as the person moves in, the robot also closes the hug. And as the person releases, the robot also releases from the hug. And here you notice that the spatial aspect um, as well as the temporal aspect are both important. So if the robot does not release at the right time, people actually reported that they feel entrapped. So that would not be really good for these kinds of scenarios. Going beyond hugging and social and interactive robots, uh, we also applied this to the ergonomic control of prosthesis. So in a case of a lower limb prosthesis, so you see here uh, my student, he's healthy, but he's using a bypass um, to wear a prosthesis. So that's a, actually a robot that's effectively like a, like a foot. So he's wearing that and we have the smart shoe at the bottom and the prosthesis is generating ankle angles in order to locomote forward. And you can see that this generates rather um, continuous and smooth control. Um, one thing that's really nice about our approach is that we can also infer hidden biomechanical variables, things like knees on the, or forces on the knee. And we can use that to perform model predictive control where we reduce forces on the knee and effectively generate biomechanically safe controllers for these prosthetics. And similarly, another scenario is collaborative assembly and collaborative manufacturing scenarios where robots and humans are assembling things together or are lifting objects together. So you really want to have a robot that's reactive to your needs and, and also anticipates how you're moving. And so with that, we come to the end of the first part of my talk. And one thing that's obviously missing in all of that is that we are mostly focused on the motion domain. We didn't really incorporate vision or language into the collaboration. And so even though we were multimodal, we did not really use any vision or language aspects. And so in the second part of my talk, I'll be talking about how we can use imitation learning, but also incorporate language instruction, um, language understanding and instruction following. So just to give you a motivation of why we would need that. Imagine you're trying to teach the robot using a typical kinesthetic teaching or learning by demonstration approach. So, well, even though we can move the robot, there are a couple of things or many things that we cannot express using the motion domain. So think of it really as a communication channel. It's limited in its bandwidth. So we can, for example, not tell the robot what the name of the target object, it, or object is, what the goal location is, what the properties of the object are, for example, grasp the yellow object or pick up the red object, what the name of the behavior is, pick and place and so on, or what the properties of motion are, so fast or slow. But all of these would be things that are relatively easy to express in language. And so the proposal that I'm making here is to incorporate descriptions, verbal descriptions into the imitation learning and demonstration process. In other words, the person would control the robot or move the robot kinesthetically, but also tell the robot, hey, pick up this object and this is a milk carton and so on. 
so that we also have semantic information which the robot can use. So how do we do that? So again, the ultimate idea is to augment imitation learning with verbal instructions, but not only verbal. Ultimately, what we want to do is to have vision, language, and motion being interrelated during demonstration. So let's make an example for that. Imagine you step into your kitchen one day and there is a robot sitting in the corner and now you go and prepare your breakfast cereal and you say, hey, I'm now picking up the milk and I'm pouring it into the bowl and then now I'm stirring and so on and so on. And now from all of that, we would like to extract a controller that allows the robot to do the same thing the next day. So in other words, if the next day you step into the kitchen and say, hey, by the way, robot, can you please prepare my breakfast cereal and make sure to pick up the milk from the red bowl um, or from the re uh, red canister or something, then the robot should be adaptive to that. And so that's what we call language condition policies. So we extract a policy that can still be conditioned on language commands and instructions. And really, ultimately, the way to look at this is as a sort of translation process. We have these modalities, vision, language, and motion, which all of three, all three of them are available at training time. But at test time, so when we're demanding something from the robot, we only have language, so the instruction itself, and vision, so what the robot currently sees, but the robot may not have motion. So what we're actually trying to infer is the motion domain, how the robot should be behaving in this case. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, obviously this really screams for deep learning and deep learning approaches because let's be honest in that domain, um, when it comes to language and vision, deep learning is where the current state of the art is. And so the proposal or the, the paper that we recently presented at NeurIPS, um, NeurIPS 2020, there we presented an end-to-end -end approach where we can transfer, not transfer, translate image input and language input, so commands from per, uh, people, into controllers, robot control actions. So this we have this big network here, and it gets as an input the current camera feed from the robot, as well as the current command from a human user. And so one aspect or subcomponent of the network actually takes in these images and commands and then translates all of that into the control parameters for the robot. And what are the control parameters? They're actually exactly the parameters that we were talking about a second ago, or like a couple of minutes ago. It's the phase, as well as the phase velocity, as well as the trajectory shape W, which is stored as these um, radial basis function weights. Okay, so that actually looks straightforward. So we can create a network, a big network that does performs this translation process, but a critical ingredient here is the training data. How do we get training data? And so the way we did that is by asking human experts. And I want to be honest, I mean, these were students. They were not necessarily great experts. So we asked a couple of students to provide 200 demonstrations by controlling a robot um, to perform this task of uh, picking an object and pouring its content into another object. And as you can see here, we have different layouts of the table, different objects, different colored objects, etc. So we collected 200 demonstrations. Now, 200 demonstrations is not enough to do deep learning. And so what we did here is we performed data augmentation. We expanded or augmented the data set into a data set that has 45,000 um, sentences or demonstrations. And the way we did that is relatively simple. We just take the sentences and replace words by their synonyms. Words, for example, like large become big and um, quickly becomes fast and so on. And so as a result of that, we can have the same um, corpus of sentences and expand it into 45,000 sentences. Now, after training, this is what we can do. The robot sees the current scenario that gets um, processed as an RGB image in the perception network. And then the person provides um, a task or a command, pick up the green cup, which gets processed in the language subnetwork. An attention network then generates a context vector, which gets translated using a submodule, which is a policy network, which gets translated into an interaction primitive that we saw earlier. And that gets then executed by moving the phase variable forward in time, which is exactly what you're seeing here, the robot doing. Now, 
for training deep learning, ultimately what's very important is the cost function. And in our case, the cost function is a little bit involved. It takes into account whether the robot identified the correct object, whether the robot is doing the correct phase estimation, so estimating where we are in time correctly, whether we are estimating the basis function weights correctly, what kind of reconstruction error we have, and all of that is ultimately combined into one big cost function. Um, ultimately, I was, or originally I was not really happy about this. This seemed to be, there were, it seemed like some of these are superfluous, but then when we tested it out, we actually saw that removing parts of this cost function actually substantially reduces the success rate. And so it seems to be that these additional components of the cost function are really important to regularize the result and, and really get a neural network that is both accurate with regards to motion and space, as well as, as, well as accurate with regards to identifying the right object to be manipulated. And just to te test out our generalization error, we also asked external, um, so other human participants, to provide new sentences. So these sentences were not trained on, and also the participants were not part of the training set. And as you can see, well, at least in some of the tasks, the uh, generalization is actually quite good, so 98 to 93%. But then, especially if you chain commands in sequence, so here we have a sequential task of pick and place, or pick and pour. And when we do that, we can see a substantial drop of 84% um, success rate with um, the testing data versus 64% success rate when we tested on new participants. So there is a substantial drop. And if we really want to generalize over a large pool of users, this is something that we certainly need to address going forward. And so just to show you kind of the, the different variations of what people could have said, there's things like elevate the green container or raise the container or um, pour everything into the round green dish or fill a little into the round red pot. So as you can see, there is quite a variability there in the different ways of expressing the same task. So obviously language comes with ambiguities. And of course, as roboticists, we had also had to apply this on a real robot just to um, also satisfy the reviewers and us. And so here you can see a robot executing it in the real world, pick up the light green cup and fill all of it into the large blue bowl. But if you change the modifier from pour all, a little or pour all of it, you will see also different results. The robot either pours just a little or most of the content um, into the bowl. Okay, but language is not everything. And so with this, we come to the end of my, uh, or the final section of my talk. And here I would like to show a completely different approach, uh, um, a multimodal approach of communicating and effectively using language, a visual form of language. And this is something we call intention projection. The ultimate idea is to use visual cues and signals to convey information to the user. And the underlying principle is to use mixed reality to project the information into the real world. So the real world becomes a canvas for our information. So for example, in this case here, um, so what you don't see, there is a beamer or like a projector with which the robot can project information into the environment, similar also here. And in this case, the robot is projecting a safety triangle saying, hey, don't touch the object as I'm now manipulating it. The critical element of our approach is that we're also tracking the environment. So the robot has, a, an inf has information about the current state of the environment, where objects are in space and what their shape is. Um, yeah, what the, what the shape is. So just to explain the setup, um, so imagine a robot and a human are collaborating with each other and the human, um, so the human and the robot need to push a box or lift a box. So in this setup here, we have a robot attached to a projector and the camera. Using the camera and computer vision techniques, we track objects in the environment. So even if the object moves, we still know where it is. And then knowing where it is and what the shape is, we can project geometrically correct information on top of it, like a texture. And so here's just an example for that. So what you're going to see here, this is our robot and it has a projector and a camera where the camera is tracking the object, which is a box. And with a projector, it's actually sending commands to the human user. So here, for example, it's saying to area one. And so as the person moves the box, 
the information on top of the box gets updated. And so now the robot is saying, hey, please don't touch the box. And it's moving in to lift the box. So this is also a great way of communicating safety information to the box, or to the user actually. And you can see that the information is updated. Since we know where the box is, we track that using our camera. We can move the virtual label, we can move that around as the box is being uh, moved around. And so again, instructions to the human to rotate the box around. OK, so that was, of course, a simple scenario. We also applied it to a more complex scenario, collaborative assembly, where there were 12 tasks that human, the human and the robot had to do in sequence together. And so again, the same principle is used here. We track the object using computer vision. And then we calculate the projected information and then project it using a projector into the environment so that the environment becomes our canvas. And then as a result of that, we can project information to the user within the environment. So this is how it looks like. So as the user is moving the car door, we have here information displayed on how much the distance, remaining distance is left. And when the user is finished, they actually display, hey, done, you're done with this task. In this case, the task is to align the car door. And this is achieved by moving a green dot on top of a white dot here. So by moving the car door, we basically control the green dot. And it's a, it's a form of, well, you could say like a gamification of the task. So another kind of signal is sending these signals about safety. Hey, please step off the, out of the area, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of information that we can actually convey this way. And you will see in a second that we can also tell the person to st stand at a certain location. So we can guide the human partner and make sure that um, the partner actually knows what, what kind of subtask he has to perform. Similarly, we can also give instructions and um, explanations on what to do. So in this task, the green line needs to be rotated on top of the white line. And when the person is finished with that, we're done. And so we wanted to, of course, understand, does this really lead to an improvement in things like human robot fluency, safety, task execution, and task load? And indeed, actually, it le led to an improvement in, in all of these uh, metrics. And we compared our method for this type of study. We compared it by uh, comparing it to a setup where we gave printed instructions to human participants or also mobile instructions, which is effectively an iPad with videos and uh, like an interactive setup where they can see videos and explanations of what they should be doing. Now, you can still say maybe this result is skewed because our, a lot of our participants are students and students have, um, well, are really good with computers and these kind of um, setups. But one thing that was really interesting to me is that a lot of the people, so even um, some people who are not uh, students and maybe people from an older generation said that the scenario was more fun, like a game. And as a result of that, more intuitive. intuitive. And this is something that I'd like to actually investigate in the future a little bit more. And, I would leave as a food for thought to, to all of you and especially myself, can we maybe use these kind of visual interfaces to give rewards back to humans? So rather than the robot receiving rewards from humans, humans receiving rewards from robots. And so if you look at, for example, a Fitbit or kind of these Apple watches, they give you these badges, these pictures to motivate you to exercise. And these pictures effectively become a reward that people chase and, and try to collect. And so maybe we can do a similar thing in order to have humans become better teachers and better collaborators for robots. And so with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Really, the ultimate goal was to talk about methodologies of how to bring humans and robots together in a shared physical space. And one thing that we talked about today is how to leverage multimodal data we, can, we saw at the beginning that this helps with estimating phase, estimating the timing of a task. And as a result of that, we were able to learn physical collaboration and interaction. We also talked about using instructions and language and how to use that as a modality for multimodal learning. And finally, we also saw that maybe the robot is giving visual feedback to a human and we could potentially also use that as a sort of a reward system. And so with that, 
um, I'd like to come to the end of my talk and thank all of my sponsors and students and thank all of you for listening today. I'm very happy um, and looking forward to take any of your questions. Thank you so much. Um, great, thanks very much for the excellent talk. I uh, love really thought provoking things. So um, people who have a question, feel free to, I don't know how you wanna handle it, but uh, maybe people can raise their hand or something, um, but I can, Absolutely. Um, Oh, actually, it looks like Aaron has a question, so I'll just go please after go Aaron. Yeah, please go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> so I, I really like the projector uh, uh, technique. Yeah, and especially I like how the warnings were put on the ground and the, and the various markings like that. It's kind of reminiscent of what you see in a factory mm. where people use like these painted lines on grounds and things like that. Yes. Um, when you ran that, to be honest, I have not seen this, that study. Did you run anything with, you know, kind of trust or kind of perceived safety within that within yes. that study? Indeed. So, so there was. Um, so we did um, basically. We asked the participants with a Likert like scale, yeah. um, and then the, the one of the questions was actually multiple questions was on safety and how they perceived safety and whether they. And then there was a different one on trust. Um, so kind of whether they trusted the system more that way. Yeah. Cause um, it, yeah. Because I, I remember Holly Yanko's team had a similar projected work cell space mm -hmm. project, but um, I don't think they had a big giant robot arm like that. I think they were using a Baxter, which is a lot less scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. In, indeed. I think yeah. one thing that was really um, critical for us is that the environment is interactive. Meaning as you change things, move things around and depending on your behavior, that changes what's being um, projected. Um, mm -hmm. So if you move the object around, then yeah. the, the pattern actually follows by being projected on top of the object or it highlights. So another critical thing was it highlights spatial locations where people need to go or where they need to put a, push a box. Mm -hmm. And so that was really a revelation for us that these spatial aspects that are really hard to convey using language or move this two centimeters away from the other box and rotate it like 60 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, visually, you can just project exactly the pattern or the like the the, the orientation yeah. and, and position it's, of the box that you want to have. And people know exactly they can just yeah, it's, the real box so that everything is on top. Yeah, it's a richer form of interaction than Charlie's old um, uh, green laser pointer. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't seen that one, but yeah. This is it Georgia Tech? This is Charlie Kemp. Oh, oh yeah, Charlie Kemp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> You're getting me into trouble there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, how do you not remember this? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, neat work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, so maybe I'll ask a question while people yeah. are thinking about questions. So I'm curious about um, with the learning. From uh, demonstrations, the space and time uh, representation. How how do you deal with issues related to um, correlation versus causation? So, um, like one that that kind of uh, comes up in the time of driving is if you're learning, you're, you're supposed to learn that when there's a red light, you stop. And so there's demonstrations of people um, pressing on the brake. Um, but one thing that sometimes can happen is is when someone in in these demonstrations someone will start pressing on the brake and the vehicle slows down and then they'll press more on the brakes the car might learn only to stop when it's already being stopped like just oh. kind of stop more um so yeah any thoughts on the correlation versus causation kind of issue i want to be honest like i have not addressed it yet but this is a great question and this is something that i really really need to carefully look at going forward just generally any sort of spurious correlation that you may have in the original training data um mm. so i i need to properly address that at the moment we are really the way we're handling that is by training across multiple participants and so hopefully um your model does not learn to kind of overfit to a person and like overfit to some sort of spurious correlation that's in one of the persons, but not in another, but we don't have something properly to handle that. So more generally, however, one metric that I'm really interested in is something called transfer entropy. I'm not sure if you're, you're aware with it, uh, of that. So it's kind of akin to mutual information, but actually transfer entropy is, is not commutative. So it, it 
it's a measure of how much information is flowing forward in time. So how much information is flowing from one agent to another. So for example, from the robot to the human and the human to the other. And you can think of it really as a sort of predictability. How much can you um, predict the other's behavior conditioned on your own behavior? And, and that seems to be a really kind of interesting measure to use and incorporate in, um, into this framework because it has been used in a, a number of studies as a measure for uh, causality effectively, um, exactly because it's not symmetric. Right? Um, and it incorporates, it's intrinsically incorporating this concept of time, how, how your actions, how much information, uh, what effect your actions have on another. And um, so that's the only kind of rough answer I can give at the moment. We haven't really address addressed this yet, but maybe by looking at these information theoretic measures like transfer entropy, maybe we could find something that allows us to kind of reduce the influence of these spurious cor correlations. Great, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, it looks like there's some hands raised if you wanna call on, so. Okay, so uh, let's see here. So um, Gokul, maybe? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, first, thanks for the great talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, uh, what, one question I have, and uh, you, you might have touched on this earlier, um, but uh, it looked like a lot of the tasks you were considering were very sort of uh, linear in some sense that, you know, they're moving, um, you know, this bowl from this place, this place. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any thoughts on, I guess, how you would learn a representation that would be able to deal with more um, I guess, uh, compositional or complicated tasks? So one of the things that we did is to, so two things. One is, one thing to keep in mind is that because we don't have any parametric assumption, you can also have multiple modes in your, uh, in your distribution. So there may be multiple answers to the same action, or multiple responses to the same action. But more generally, one thing that we, um, Kind of that, that we have a paper at ICRA 2016 on is a, a composition, so a mixture of interaction primitives. So if you have a task that may be composed of like different eventualities, you could say, like di different versions of executing that task, then you can um, basically learn that as a superposition or mixture of these interaction primitives. So in other words, you just collect training uh, samples from all of these eventualities, like where um, it was effectively what you called um, linear. Um, so you have one linear behavior, another linear behavior, another linear behavior. You just collect all of that data and learn a mixture, which is, uh, you can think of it really as a mixture of experts. Um, and that's something that we proposed in one of the papers and actually works really well, especially for collaborative assembly, where there may be actually multiple responses to, to the same input stimulus. Uh, okay. Uh, that makes sense. Um, uh, I guess um, uh, a kind of related thought would be yeah. that um, if there's like, you know, something where, you know, uh, I guess, let's say you're, uh, I don't know, uh, making yourself uh, some sort of meal, right? And maybe the first step is uh, for the robot to do is to, you know, pour water into the, into some sort of thing. Step yeah. two is, you know, put rice, maybe and for another thing, it's put pasta into the bowl. I'm asking how you would handle kind of things like that, where it's, there's almost like a branching effect. Um, yeah, so, so ultimately kind of the way um, we did that in the mixture, kind of mixture of experts approach is that you can also calculate the likelihood for each one of the components of your mixture. So let's say kind of you have um, like pouring and then some other task and some other task, as you mentioned. And so the first thing that we do is we take the observations from the person and we likely, uh, we calculate the likelihood that this observation belongs to any one of our behaviors. And then you pick in this mixture um, of kind of from, from this model, you pick the one action that effectively maximizes your likelihood. Does this make sense? So you have like this mixture of components and you pick the one that maximizes li your likelihood. And so then you execute the interaction primitives. So the inference, you do it within that component. Um, but at every time step, you reevaluate in which one of the components you are. And so in the next time step, if the person maybe moves on and starts doing something else, uh, you may identify, okay, now he, is, he or she is moved on to the next component. And then you basically do inference within that. 
Does this roughly make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I think so, right. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, so like one thing we... I want to say, however, is that this doesn't really model any sort of planning. There is no planning involved. It's relatively reactive, everything. You observe the other, and then depending on what they're doing, you, you're trying to figure out in which one of these classes am I? And then within the class, you can do the continuous inference to figure out what the phase variable is, and then um, also what your response should be. Got it, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, maybe Ruben then? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, Great. hi. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. I have Thanks. a bunch of questions, but I'll pick one. Yeah, please, which is, um, So I understand that sort of the, the, the base sort of work, the first work you talked about is sort of kind of playing back trajectories in a pretty robust way sort of, of up yeah. to a lot of in, in initial conditions. And then your sort of your second thing you talked about was trying to kind of condition this in some amount of kind of semantic yeah. representation. Um, how explicit is that sort of semantic representation? And like, you know, how, how do you sort of think about, does it make sense to sort of reason explicitly about the objects in the scene versus sort of doing everything latent? Um, oh, oh, that's a great question. So here's my take on this and i want to be honest i'm not necessarily coming i'm not like a great lang natural language guy and i, I only uh, got interested in this because my phd student really wants to do this and um, and ultimately the way we do that is we actually take the sentence and we generate these latent representations so you're absolutely right but we actually also continue training that we try to continue training the latent representation such that these cost the components of the cost function um, are fulfilled or kind of minimized. And one of the components is that it actually identifies the right object. And so we still move the latent representation around and learn effectively a different embedding. Um, if we kind of learn, or if it turns out that our initial language model does not identify the right object. But as another part of this cost function, we're also using the trajectory reconstruction loss. So in other words, while we are learning the language, we're also priming the language and trying to find what kind of representation is great for language that would actually also help us with generating the right movements and trajectories, which is an additional spin to, you could say, to the traditional approach of, of learning these language embeddings. Typically, you learn a language embedding that's good for, for either language task or combined task with language and vision. But now we're adding also this additional condition of, hey, However, you, you're kind of generating these embeddings, it should be helpful to the actual physical task for the robot later on. And so I hope this kind of at least partially answers your question that by incorporating things into the cost function, we can still move around and kind of play around with this latent embedding so that it really helps us with the task. Thanks, yeah, that's, that answers it a lot. I have more, but other people. And, and I'm happy to kind of follow up and like maybe offline with you, like maybe we can just kind of get in contact yeah, via definitely. email. I'd love to talk. Send you an email. That would Thank be great. You so much. Any other question? Okay, dokie. In that case, I'd say thank you all so much for taking the time. Um, thank you for hosting me. Um, David, and um, yeah, I hope that we all see each other maybe at some moment soon um, when all of this pandemic goes away. So please stay safe. And uh, this is an open invitation to all of you to come visit me in Tempe. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for giving the very interesting talk. Uh, let's all thank Kenny. Thank you so much. Thank you.